two scripture passages this morning. And the first one is from the Gospel according to St. Luke. And this is about Jesus' crucifixion. I'm reading from Luke 23, starting at verse 32. Two men, criminals, were led out with Jesus to be executed. And when they came to the place called the Skull, there they crucified him along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. And the people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, Ha, ah, he saved others. Let him save himself if he, if he is the Christ of God, the chosen one. And the soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, Ah, you're the king of the Jews. Save yourself. There was a written notice above it which read, This is the king of the Jews. And one of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. And then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. And then I'm reading from Paul's letter to the Colossian church. And I'm reading from chapter 1. Beginning with uh, around, uh, um, around verse 11. Verse 10, actually. We pray that in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please Him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you might have great endurance and patience, and joyfully giving thanks to the Father, who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness, and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. And I'll go down a little further. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, 
not removed from the whole path of the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard, and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven, and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. May God and his blessing his holy word, both now and forever. When you were listening to the scripture readings being read before the choir sang that beautiful piece just now, you may have been thinking to yourself, uh, whoa, wait a minute, she's reading about Jesus on the cross. That's for Easter time. Did I fall asleep and I missed Christmas? And the second passage, well, I have no idea what that was all about. That was just so complicated. Well, my friends, if those were your thoughts, you're not alone, okay? For those passages that were suggested for this study, with that first passage, I also wondered about it being placed just before we start Christmas themes. And the second passage is pretty deep, but it's great. By way of some explanation as to why these are here now, today in church life, this Sunday is kind of like New Year's Eve. You know how on New Year's Eve you, you may look back on what you did the past year and where you are now and also your hopes for the new year. You know, old Lang Syne and Happy New Year stuff. And so 
if we look at the life of Jesus on earth, we know that his life began as a baby, and also in adulthood he died on a cross, with people thinking that that was it, but it wasn't. And in between those times of his birth and crucifixion, we often looked at what he did, reaching out to people, teaching people, healing people, telling of God's love. And then he died on the cross, almost ending his physical presence as a human being here on earth. And so his birth to his resurrection is kind of like our January to December. Of course, we know that Jesus came back to life, and we, those who are his followers, are with him into the future, even as we're here now. Also, this brings us kind of in a roundabout way to this Sunday being known as Christ the King Sunday. This Sunday became known as Christ the King Sunday, or Reign of Christ Sunday, thanks to the influence way back in 1925 of Pope Pius XI. And he brought it out due to the threat of totalitarianism after World War I. Pope Pius could see that many people were tossing the Lord out from their lives and choosing to go their own things. Sadly, much as we see happening now in individual lives in our governments, um, people say, no, oh, no, but that was old times. We don't believe in God anymore. We don't believe. We're going to do our own thing. And the Pope realized that in their doing so, that there would be no real chance of lasting peace without Christ the King. And he wanted to bring people to realize that Jesus as King was their hope of peace. Unfortunately, later, another pope, Pope Pius XII, he did a lot of that teaching that Pope Pius XI had brought in. I don't know if they succeeded one another, but he became uh, he in, in contact with influ influential leaders like Mussolini and Hitler. And so he did a lot of what Pope Pius XI had done. So that's just some background information of where Christ the King Sunday came from. But it's hard, I think, for people to think of Jesus as King, isn't it? Because Jesus didn't look like the human idea of a King when he was here on earth. There was no pomp and circumstance about Jesus. Jesus was in disguise. They didn't know. He didn't look like a King. One of the funniest stories told about Queen Elizabeth, Queen Elizabeth, was how one day she was walking through the woods with her guard, her escort, up in her castle in Scotland. And there was an American couple, they were also taking a walk through the woods, and they stopped to exchange pleasantries, like, oh, hi, where are you from? What do you do? That kind of thing. And the Americans asked the guard, that since he also worked in England, because the guard said he, he was up in Scotland from time to time, he also worked in England, they said, well, you work in England, have you ever met, have you ever met the Queen? And he said, well, yes, yes, I, I actually worked for her. And they were so excited, and they were wondering what she was like. And he smiled and said something like, well, she can be rather bossy sometimes. And, and the Queen, and he chuckled, because the Queen was standing right beside him. And then the couple decided that since the man worked for the Queen, they would like to have a photo with him to show their friends back in the States. And they asked the Queen to take the picture. And they feel a little bit sorry for this elderly lady. I guess she looked like anybody up there you often see her with a kerchief around her head and maybe she had a kilt on. It, it, they felt a little story for her, so they took her picture too. And uh, after they left, the couple left, the queen chuckled and she said, can you imagine how surprised the American couple is going to be when they show their friends those pictures? <laughs> and uh, can we also add how stupid and embarrassed we must feel? <laughs> 
just, well, oh no, we didn't know. Oh, she must have been, they would be so embarrassed. But the queen was in disguise. No crown, no crown. And don't we also do that in terms of Jesus being the king of kings? Because he didn't go around wearing his crown and royal robes. We forget his power and his glory. St. Paul in his letter to the Colossian church was reminding them that Jesus is the invisible, is the image of the invisible God, the creator of the world, the preserver of the world, and he was working in the world for its redemption. It's good if you have time to go back and read that section, folks. It's loaded, okay? But it's great. And what's quite impressive, though, who, who all Jesus is? That's quite impressive, isn't it? Compared to how high and powerful some of our world leaders think of themselves today, compared to Jesus, they're nothing. He's, he's, uh, he's the one. Uh, not Bill Gates or Elon Musk or Klaus Schwab who has the capital of a thousand hills. It's Jesus that has all that. It's not all these people who think they're hotty hotty. He created them. And no wonder the scriptures say that compared to God, even the most powerful will be dust, as dust. Paul says that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. I think that sometimes we have problems visualizing God's personality, aside from the fact that he's very, very great and powerful, don't we? You know, hence the reflection title today, who do you take after? Have you ever been told, you know you just look like, you look just like your mom, or you look just like your dad, or your mannerisms are the same, or the way you said that is, oh, it's just so much like your mom or your dad. You, you, you've got their, 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 your mannerisms are just like them. Or maybe you answer the phone, and the person who's phoning, starts guessing which family member you're speaking to because you all sound alike, you sound. So Jesus said, if you want to know what God is like, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I've got his mannerisms. I've got his personality. That's who God is like. Jesus is the replica of God. It's something to consider, isn't it? And how often in our busy lives we just pass over that reality. Now with all the power that God has in creating the world and is still in power, think of how his might and his power, the snowflake, the there's nothing, nothing to a light, and a blade of grass, the miracle, the miracles of his creation. When you think of all that power, look at him in Jesus and how he gently reaches out in love to us is created. Think of how Jesus treated the fallen people that he encountered. The woman caught in adultery, the dishonest tax collector, the thief on the cross, the lepers, the blind, the mentally ill, his disciples, none of them perfect, and on and on with examples we could go. Think of how he treated human beings with love and such consideration. And no wonder the leaders around him felt so threatened. People were loving the hope that Jesus gave them and the life that he gave them and wanted to make him their ruler. And Jesus wasn't falling in line with the religious leaders' directions of governing. And after a while, when Jesus refused to reuse his miraculous power to overthrow the Romans, and he got this and said, ah, yeah, right. You won't overthrow our enemies, so I think you are. You're just a troublemaker. Get rid of him. And so they had a troublemaker, the king of heaven and earth, crucified, somewhat amusingly not realizing that in this, Jesus was in control. This was part of his plan. Part of his love plan. Someone sometime pointed out that human beings are souls with bodies. We are created in the image of, of the divine. But you know who 
we know that often we don't behave like that, right? We're flawed. We're flawed. We have rough spots and dents. The divine God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit continued, though, to love us and reached out as only love could do. As a human being, Jesus declared us the guilty as being forgiven and free by his death on the cross, taking our place, by paying our praise price by dying in our place. That's love. I'll take your place. You've done wrong. I'll take your place. And you'll be declared not guilty. Free to go. Can you imagine that? We see so much division in our world today, right? But we also see people reaching out in love. Giving people hope by showing them the love of the Lord. Love doesn't mean that we can do whatever we want and live however we want. And then God will be fine with that. God includes reaching out with God's truth about who we are. Often causing us to reevaluate what and how we're doing things. So that we can go in God's divine way of life. Jesus' love reaches out to us in the gutters of life and he pulls us up and he gives us dignity and purpose in his royal family. Paul writes, We pray that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, for he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves. He, he lifts us up, he sets us on the path and says, this is the way, this is the way. Live in my love and you'll experience my joy and my peace. On this Christ the King Sunday, we once again recognize that Jesus is King. He has started his kingdom. He started it when he came to earth. And he will rule. And everyone, including his enemies, will see him and one day bow down to him. He invites us to be part of his royal kingdom. Princes and princesses. When Jesus took after, Jesus said he, he, is, he is the invisible image of his father. And he called God his father, and he calls his followers his brothers. And he taught us to pray, Our Father, which art in heaven. His followers were included. And so today we might ask ourselves, who do I take after? Whose kingdom? The kingdom of darkness or God's kingdom of light and joy and life will people see in me? We have something to do to share this love, his love, his life, his joy with the people around us. He calls us to be part of his eternal kingdom. May God be with us. Amen. Let us sing again, Jesus shall reign, number 330, and voices united.
face this morning. Now, if you've forgotten your offering, don't worry. You can come back next Sunday. <laughs> but uh, we're just trying to get back into the practice of back to some of the normal routine that we did. And Doreen, what are you going to sing? Well, SOG 96, verse 1 and 4. God will take care of you. <coughs> Number 96. 96. If you take the little song to the gospel book and turn to 96, verse 1 and 4, while the offering is being
weak loyalties of age. God of all that is, we tremble at the wonder of you. We reach up for you, stretching as high as we can, but you are beside us already. We run away from you, fearing hard judgment and fearful challenges. But we find we have run into the great hub of your embrace. We wall ourselves off from you, from others, from Earth, from ourselves. We do find new doorways through our walls, and you open us up to life and hope. We are lost because we will not turn to you. We are found because you always turn to us. So this morning we pray that you will take our poor, weak, fumbling prayers, mix them with your loving strength, and send them forth to help you bless our world. We dare to pray for peace, even though, even though we do so little for it. May the day come soon when robots no longer carry warheads, but explorers of the heavens. For the submarines no longer are ready to fire on all the cities, but die instead to chart the mysteries of the deep. The planes no longer carry bombs, but people reaching out to other people around the world. We pray especially this day for our our nation, that we may have the courage to come back to you, to honor you in our, in our family lives, in our churches, in our schools, in our governments, that we may lead the world by setting the example of your love. We pray for our world that aches with the hunger and poverty of most of its people. We remember all without shelter, those who must rummage through garbage, for scraps of food. Please stand with us, O God, as we question our own lifestyles and struggle to make changes so that others will have more. Our Father, we remember so many people who in Jesus' day were healed. And many in our own family circles, we pray, will also be healed of their diseases as they were back then. We pray that your powerful hand will cure those who have life-threatening diseases, those who are undergoing surgery, those who are experiencing great pain, and those whose physical and mental capacities are limited. And yet we know that Jesus did not heal everyone in the land, and that most of the people with dread diseases had to live with their disabilities. And so we pray for those who will not be healed, those whose cancer will take its course, those whose handicaps will continue to live in them, those whose pain will be a reality in their lives. Help them to understand that their illness is not a judgment upon their faith, and give them the grace to triumph in other ways, as many, many others have done, and they have found joy, contentment, and peace in their lives. And, oh God, give us the courage to risk following Jesus. Help us to trust his words, even when they seem hard. Give us honesty to tell him how we really feel. Give us a vision of how he would use us, even the least of us, to right the corner where we are. And grant us contentment with what you give to us today. Help us to make more of your gifts tomorrow than we did yesterday. All this we ask with prayerful hearts for our Lord and Savior, Jesus, with grateful hearts for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us conclude our service this morning as we sing more about Jesus than I know. And again, it's out of the little blue songs of the gospel book. We'll sing verses uh, 1, 2, and 3. Then we'll have the benediction, and then we'll see verse 4, 179.
and live within you to strengthen you. And may his blessings, including from God the Father and God the Holy Spirit, be with you now.